This Bo Deadly record, which was the original one released in the 50s, is done on, you'll notice, chess records. Okay. Um, Bo Deadly, of course, is from the Delta, as it discloses on the back. Um, they listed it as Clarksdale. I was thinking it wasn't, but that, that's what they state. Records was um, well known back then. This is an old uh, 78, one of uh, Muddy Waters' first. It's got a little dust on it. Uh, all aboard, and then on the back side, you've got 40 Days and 40 Nights, which is one of the more well known ones. Um, these are stamps. I'm, I'm always proud to celebrate Mississippi, and I was glad to see the U.S. Post Office uh, recognize Mississippi and its connection with the blues. But chess uh, would go on to be checkers, and this is, uh, of course, Sonny Boy Williamson, not to be confused with Honey Boy. Um, this is uh, Sonny Boy, who he contributed to the story as well. Now, going back to Gunner Hotel, as I was mentioning, uh, Don Law was the gentleman who discovered uh, Robert Johnson. <clears throat> And that's a network from Jackson, Mississippi, and he would eventually work his way to Don Law. Now, this is not Don Law's autograph. This is his son, Don Law Jr., who uh, in his own right was a famous uh, uh, promotion uh, gentleman and uh, recorder. And he was famous for working with Led Zeppelin and several other names. So that's the autograph of uh, his son, Don Law Jr. But Don Law is the one who famously recorded uh, Robert and Gunter Hotel. Um, so you see the connection between chess and checkers, uh, which would eventually give us Bo Diddley but long before we would even learn of who Robert Johnson was. Robert only had so many albums made. And as we know, the, the original Vocalion records, if you're lucky enough to get them, um, they are very expensive. I was very, very fortunate to win this uh, on an auction. This is a catalog you would have gotten when you bought a Vocalion record or maybe you got it in the store, what have you. This is from uh, July of 1937. What makes this really, really unique to me um, is if you look here, this is advertising, and you will see that it says, Sweet Home Chicago, Robert Johnson. Um, this is in addition to Walk and Blues. This is the closest I can get to the time period in his original albums. You know, I don't have the money for the, the albums. But this is very significant. Uh, this is shortly before he passed. Uh, this is in July. Remember, he, he was uh, in Dallas in June. Um, and that was the second time. That's, that's in Dallas. Gunter Hotel with Don Law was in San Antonio. Now, in addition to Don Law Jr., I've got uh, John Hammond's son, who is a musician in his own right. This is an album he did with Tom Waits. Uh, I do have his autograph, uh, The Son. Now, he, he became a blues legend in his own right. Uh, his father, John Hammond Sr., uh, which I have the original newspaper articles. These are just copies. Um, he never got to meet Robert as um, Don Law did. But how he is significant is that he had been told about Robert and he was planning uh, what they called the From Spirituals to Swing concert, which would take place at Carnegie Hall in 1938, uh, right around the holidays. This is a record, uh, the earliest re recording. And <clears throat> at the time, there was a poster and uh, I will include a picture of that poster uh, right here. But at the time, they put Robert Johnson's uh, name on there, and uh, they had anticipated he would uh, indeed end up performing 
But unfortunately, when they sent word down to the Delta, they found out that Robert had died um, a few months prior. So the posters already had Robert's name on there before Robert even knew he was going to play. You know, he was, of course, he passed on. Uh, what they did was they substituted uh, Big Bill Brunzi uh, to play in his place. And a lot of uh, blues fans know who, who Big uh, Bill Brunzi was. But if it had not been for the death of Robert Johnson, he wouldn't have performed. But the original posters that have Robert's name on there, hard to come by and worth a lot of money, obviously, because it was the only public recognition we had um, other than the records that were put out in a limited copy. And then, of course, this is the only thing I found that mentions him uh, prior to the world coming to know him through King of the Delta Blues, which would set in motion a lot of interest from uh, British um, the animals, Eric Burden of the animals said that when it came to the British invasion, really they looked at it as just bringing us our music back because they were so greatly influenced by blues musicians and what have you. This is Eric Clapton's promotional copy that would have been sent out to radio stations prior to the release of his album, uh, Me and Mr. Johnson. And this is a sampler that would have had a few of the songs that Eric was doing covers of that were Robert Johnson songs. But this kind of give you an idea separate from Bo Diddley and, and Muddy Waters um, is it, it went on to influence, of course, Cream did Crossroads. Um, so the, the, the influence is great. Now, many people know Robert, of course, for doing Sweet Home Chicago. And we know that from Blues Brothers, another movie that kind of got me interested in the blues. I want to I want to say this first of all. The key thing to remember about Robert is that when he was doing these recordings, um, he was only playing acoustic guitar. There's no recordings of him playing electric. Now, a lot of people um, have asked me, what's the difference between Chicago blues and um, the Delta Blues. Well, I say uh, electricity is really what it is. When they are getting to Chicago, which, by the way, we don't know for certain that Robert Johnson was ever in Chicago. Uh, the song he did was somewhat of a ripoff of another song. And It's rhythm and all. He actually says California more than he does Chicago. There's been speculation that he had family in California and that they may have lived on a Chicago street. So they, they surmise that possibly that's what he was referring to when he said Sweet Home Chicago. But there is really no proof that Robert was in Chicago, though uh, Johnny Shines, who traveled with him, uh, has alluded to the fact that that he did, uh, but it's kind of debatable whether there's any solid proof. So during Jim Crow, when a lot of African Americans were leaving the South and moving to the North, uh, St. Louis was one area, New York was another area, but Chicago was a big area, okay? And Chicago would be where uh, Muddy Waters, which this, by the way, is an original uh, uh, picture. There's only one copy. This is it. And it's from Germany in uh, 1976, taken by a press reporter. So you see all the different markings, the stages it goes through. Um, this is when they get to Chicago, which these are original postcards. So if you can imagine, you would get off the bus, and right there you would be at, um, at a park, and that was called Grant Park in Chicago. So if you got off the bus or the train or what have you, this would have been what you would have seen in the 30s, um, is this park. In fact, the last marker for the Blues Trail stops here in uh, Grant Park, and they, they've uh, had blues concerts there for a while now. It's a famous uh, landmark for the blues. So Delta musicians, African Americans from the South, would have seen this, uh, and this is, a, a, again, this is a 30s postcard, so it's 1938. This would have been what a lot of people would have seen, like Muddy Waters and, and other people that would end up making Chicago their home. 
And this is another place. This is Maxwell Street, a Jewish uh, flea market where a lot of these musicians would have set up on the corner to perform. So had Robert gone there, he might have played right here, which is another authentic card from the period. So these are two significant uh, landmarks for Chicago, uh, where the blues get started and where they discover the electric guitar.